a community with content and cool stuff by Amanda Gorman. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. How are we? Good. Doing good? Awesome. It's a beautiful day. Happy WordCamp Day 2. Thank you for coming back and being here with me this morning. Uh, I love this conversation. I've been diving into this for a long time, ever since I knew I was going to be speaking. And before that, just with the passionate clients that I work with, I work with a lot of creatives, uh, people that are creating art, uh, they're teaching yoga, they're having holistic businesses. Uh, something of that similar nature and they don't really care or they want to care about the technical side of things to make their website do magical things for them but they don't necessarily know how to bridge the gap between their creativity and how it plays in with SEO and specifically their website content so that's one of my favorite things to do with people is to help bridge that gap and I like to think of SEO as a blueprint for creativity um, so who here has already been to an SEO talk or this weekend, or has some basic, cool, awesome. And who here knows nothing about SEO like at all? No? Okay, yeah. Well, this is geared towards everybody. I really tried to break it down to a point where everybody can get something to take away. It's, we're not gonna get super technical, but we're gonna get really deep into the keyword research aspect of things and how we can get to a finalized piece of content that's gonna draw in your people, your audience. So we're going to go ahead and dive in. So this WordPress community has taught me so much about what it means to be connected and what community actually stands for. So specifically in my own experience, my WordPress community has led me to the career that I'm currently in at GiveWP. And it's led me to have the confidence to build an online community for my yoga studio back home in Rochester, New York. Without that experience of working with WordPress, knowing SEO, and working with clients individually, I don't know that I would have had the assets to contribute to the collaborative that I'm in in my yoga studio at home. So it's been an amazing experience to be a part of this WordPress community, to feel supported, and to use my skills to really create a community in my own home. Um, working with my SEO clients specifically, I've been able to help support creative initiatives in ways that I could have never imagined. So I just really want to put this emphasis on how important community is and bringing our attention kind of away from, I just want traffic, I just want people coming to my site, to what kind of people are actually coming? What does that community look like? What are they doing on your website? And why, do you, why should they come to you? Uh, it's, it's a different kind of mindset that we're shifting here. So first, tending to your garden. I love to visualize SEO as a garden landscape. Um, it's not something that you can just plant and walk away and never come back to, right? It's gonna die and wither away and be very sad. So like a garden, it needs tending to, it needs love and care, it needs attention, maybe even on a daily basis. So very similar, your SEO strategy or really anything online, your online marketing strategy, it requires this tending to a uh, consistent uh, really seeing what is needed and then providing what's needed. So in this conversation of tending to your little internet garden, you're kind of taking up space in your own website, this landscape, if you will, that you're taking up online. And what you're planting in your garden, what kind of ideas you're putting in the ground to grow and to nourish, it really starts with keyword research, and that's where we're heading. But before we get there, I really want to just put this emphasis on the importance of knowing that this is your little piece of landscape, and we need to make sure that we're constantly nurturing it. So this question that we're all here today, thank you again, is how do we build this online community? How do we actually make this garden grow into a thing that's going to bear fruit, if you will. So the question becomes, how do we get traffic? How do we get more engagement? How do we get more conversions, more conversation on my website, my little landscape of internet that I'm taking up space on? How do we do this? And my answer to this question, and it's really more to take you down your own path, is to be intentional, to be aware, 
and to build trust. And those are the three strategies that are going to be relating to keyword research, competitor analysis, and content writing. So these three aspects of SEO and building your own presence online is going to become so important with answering this question of community and what that looks like for you. Keyword research, being intentional. So here, this is really where we start to look into the nitty gritty, very little seed of where we're starting. This is where the ideas are planted. This is where our strategy in SEO starts. And it's where we're going to be able to better understand why we're doing what we're doing. Becoming intentional with our keyword research means that we're taking our time and not just seeing, oh, I should write about this or that, and like being, I know for me, I need to have some direction in what I'm doing in any part of life, because there's constantly distractions and there's constantly competitors and other conversations to have. It's very difficult to know where our focus is best directed. So I believe keyword research, and from my experience working with my clients, providing just a little bit of insight in where to start is fundamental for how the rest of the process goes. We can waste a lot of time, I have, with my own SEO practices, going down rabbit holes that really led me nowhere. I made, may have learned some things, but was it relevant to what I was really looking to do originally? I don't know. So really just starting with becoming super intentional through keyword research is where we're going to begin. So the core concept of keyword research is essentially knowing the keywords that you want to rank for versus what that actually looks like to your community. So the first question I always ask my people, my SEO people, my clients, is what do you want to rank for? Like, what does SEO mean to you in terms of somebody's putting in a search and you want to show up? You want to be that authority? You want to be that go-to person for that particular term? What are those terms? Usually I get a list of some brand name, you know, related to their brand or their product or services, some really big ideas. Um, in, this, in the example of a garden, maybe it's just garden supply or garden center. It's a very uh, basic kind of principle that has a big idea that we're not really sure where the specifics are in it. So what I do is take those ideas that my clients provide, this list of 10 to 20 keywords, and then I expand on it. I help them narrow down and really become closer to their customer or their client. So I love this quote regarding empathy. Empathy is the starting point for creating a community and taking, a taking action is the impetus for creating change. So really when we get in the spot of our person that we're looking to come to us, our audience, we really do take this empathetic approach. We have to. We can't assume anything about them. We have to get in their own perspective and understand what they need and what they're not getting already from what's provided online. So we start with seed keywords. And I mentioned that uh, a little bit is the list that I receive from my clients when I first ask them, what do you want to rank for? Uh, the, I usually get a list of seed keywords without them knowing it. Um, it's really just these little basic keywords that are usually one to three words that are representing a big idea, a big topic. They're usually extremely competitive. There's usually some Google AdWords out there relating to these keywords because they are so competitive and there's so much search going on for them. So in staying with this garden analogy, it's our seed. It's our little uh, seed that we're planting so that we can ideally nourish that with the proper nutrients to grow into something maybe a little more specific, um, something that's going to actually bear uh, the fruit of what we're actually trying to get to. So with working with seed keywords, we're, again, talking about your brand name might be your seed keyword, your product or service, your category or your niche. Really like get as general as you can. And I love to do a brain dump with this, just writing, free write, all you can. Uh, it's really difficult for me to even work with a new client. Um, I choose to work with clients that I'm super passionate about what they're doing. Um, so for example, uh, like a, a garden center that I've worked with, 
I, I love all the intricacies of all their offerings and all the different kind of plants they sell and why somebody might choose one or the other. And I love to get all my ideas out first as a consumer of like, what would I want? What, from my perspective, would I want to see? And what all are all those categories? What do they look like? So doing a brain dump of just getting all your ideas out on paper first can kind of clear you out and help you to get into a place of narrowing your focus. So here for this garden center example, uh, some of the big ideas that I've worked with is garden supply, container gardening was a big one, gardening tips, backyard landscaping, and gardening gifts. So these are all very big ideas. It's going to be very difficult to rank for any particular individual keyword here because they are so big. There's lots of searches for these. So here, my very first step, and after you've done your brain dump, it's a good idea to just plug one of your seed keywords into Google, and you're going to get a list of related searches. So Google helps us a lot with this. You can also find these related searches at the very bottom of your search result page for whatever keyword you're inputting in Google, and it's going to show you all these related search terms that are going to lead you to the same kinds of content. Um, so these are really good clues to be like, oh, I forgot about catalogs, I forgot about coupons, or um, different kind of other aspects with your business. And you might actually get some clues as to which you don't want to focus on. So keyword terms like a warehouse. Maybe that isn't relevant to this garden center that's a very small local shop. Maybe that's not a relevant search for them. Or mailing plants to the home. Maybe that's something we don't want to be focusing on in our content. And you can have a list of this is not where our attention is focused. So working with these seed keywords, uh, very similar to plugging each keyword into Google and finding your related search terms, uh, that's going to lead you down a path of finding long tail keywords. And really, the focus here is taking one seed keyword, finding related searches. So I usually, we're going to get to this in a minute, but I create this uh, spreadsheet and a Google Sheet, uh, for example, a shared document that my, my client can use on a long term basis. Each little tab is a seed keyword, and the document contains all the related searches to that seed keyword within the document. And these tools are going to become fundamental for creating those lists, building on your seed keywords. So each one of these are some of my favorite to use. And the objective here is to find the desire and specific pain points within your industry for each individual seed topic that you can really nail down on. And instead of using Google search to plug in and find and write down or copy and paste all these terms, you can use these free tools. So Uber Suggest is a good one for getting all those uh, Google Suggest uh, keywords. So Uber Suggest basically pulls in all of those uh, related search terms that Google is going to spit out to you when you put in a seed <laughs> keyword. And it's going to give you a nice report. Um, same thing with um, keyword IO. It's keyword.io, and these are all clickable in my slides, so I'll, have you, I'll give you the link for those. You can click on these, and it'll send you right to each individual tool. And uh, Google Correlate is obviously related phrases. Um, it's, it's Google actually provides us with some uh, associated keywords. It might end up being another seed keyword, and you can kind of play with that. Uh, you might end up combining your seed keywords if things are, in terms of your research, kind of overlapping a lot. Um, so it kind of depends on your industry. Um, and then Google Trends is also a really great place to come when you're really trying to identify the value of your individual seed keyword and where this topic is going, where it's been. Uh, so Google Trends will give us a, a timeline of what's been happening with this particular search term and what the relevancy is at this current period of time. And you can kind of get a, a prediction for where it's going. So that can be really helpful for best prioritizing your efforts. Um, Answer the Public is also one of my favorites. This is going to be a really helpful one for a blog post that you're looking to answer a specific question and provide a really specific value. Because if you're looking on Answer the Public and you find a question that you hear all the time in your brick and mortar or on your blog or just in your conversations with people, you're going to find some validation here by going to Answer the Public and seeing similar questions or maybe filling in the gaps with questions you might be not seeing. So once we have this document that we're creating, these seed keywords are each on the bottom here, each little tab I created for this garden center. 
And I just started filling out my list. So for container gardening, gardening as my seed keyword, every uh, LSI keyword or long tail keyword is going to be filled in within that document. And you can go as wild as you want with this. I really give myself free reign to just really fill in as much as I can here from the, the tools that I use. And I'll usually use at least three or four of them just to make sure I'm not missing anything. And then you can kind of start to nail down and what's relevant to this client, what's not, what's relevant to my blog and what's not, depending on if you're writing your own content or writing for your client. So here uh, is going to come in Google Keyword Planner. So we're going to want to utilize this free tool. I, there's a lot of other tools out there as well. Moz is a, is a good one. Ahrefs is also another good one. Those are paid subscriptions. Um, so I'm not necessarily uh, encouraging that you have to pay a monthly $150 a month to get all your keyword research, but you can. And I have, and it is very helpful. But I also more tend to use Google Keyword Planner because it is free. And it actually has just got a facelift. And before we were seeing clicks were kind of averaged. It's like you could receive a click between 0 and 100 or 50 and 1,000. And it's like, I, that doesn't help me. So now you can actually put in a date range in Google Keyword Planner. And it's going to give you an average of the amount of clicks you can expect. And this is from a perspective of a Google AdWord. And this is still relevant for organic search. It's very relevant because it shows us how much popularity there is for each individual keyword. So for this example, we're looking for keyword, the clicks, the impressions, the cost, the click-through rate, and the average cost per click. And these are all going to be clues as to how competitive is this keyword. And of course, the seed keywords that we're working with are going to be the most competitive, usually. And then the long tail keywords that are longer than three words usually a more specific phrase, they're going to be a little less competitive and a little more easier to target and to probably knock off some other competition that's already out there. Um, so this tool is going to help you identify how much are people willing to spend on this keyword and is it worth going after. So this is how we're going to fill up that document. So that's kind of what it's going to look like. I usually export, I uh, will copy and paste all of my long tail keywords that I've built into each individual seed keyword tab spreadsheet. Copy and paste all those one at a time of the tab that is. Going into Google Keyword Tool, paste them in there, get all my data, and then copy everything from an export tool, put it back in my spreadsheet, and paste over the keywords that were already there just so that you have everything lined up correctly. Um, that seems to be the easiest way that I've, I've found. So you get a spreadsheet. Yay, spreadsheet. I love Oprah, so I was very happy that this uh, gift was out there. Um, so you have a spreadsheet. Like, what do we do with all this data? Like, when I first started doing SEO, I, I would provide my uh, clients with this massive document of keyword research and be like, isn't this so cool? Like, look at this. They were like, yeah, what does it mean? <laughs> like, what is this? Like, this is overwhelming. It's a lot. It can be a lot. Um, so that's where we're going. So the next step is competitor analysis and being aware. Uh, being aware of your market, of your industry, really taking the time to understand what's going on in your industry and how you fit into the mix. It can be maybe spying a little bit on your competitors, but I don't really like to see it that way. I do see a lot of content in the SEO world that's saying spy on your competitors to get insights, but I really see it more of uh, being aware of what's going on and how you become an authority for your specific niche and your unique value that you're providing your people. Uh, it doesn't have to be such a, a negative thing of my competitors doing this, so I have to be competing with them. It's more understanding what your competitors are doing so that you can understand what's missing. What are they not doing? What are they not representing well? What kind of content are they producing that just doesn't answer the question? That just is clickbait, that just brings people in just to get a click, and then that's it. So what can we do to be better? So uh, I do use Moz, a free tool, again, the Moz Bar. Uh, download the Moz Bar. It's an amazing tool. I love to use it for this specific uh, analysis of competitor research because you're going to be able to plug in your keyword that you're looking at Maybe it's one of your long tail keywords that you really are interested in writing some copy for. And you can plug it into Google. You're going to turn on your Moz bar. And 
we're going to start to look for some of these attributes here. So you're going to enter your keyword in Google, look for one or more of the below, and then you're going to evaluate the content once you kind of identify if they are related to any of these uh, identifiers here. So page authority and domain authority comes into the conversation here. The Moz bar provides you with, I'll show it in the next slide what it looks like, but it provides you a little ranking score for page and domain authority. And that essentially means what the each uh, page, what a, for page authority, it's the individual ranking score in Google of how likely it is that that page is going to be ranked. And it's out of a scale of 100, so 0 to 100. And usually a page authority or domain authority of less than 20 is going to be a good bet that you could probably go after and uh, write some really awesome content around this particular search term. And if you do it well and really answer the question and follow these principles, you're likely going to be ranked above the competitors that are currently out there. Also looking for sites that are um, answering questions, just like a blog site or um, Buzzle, Yahoo Answers, Ask.com. If there's a lot of those kind of uh, uh, articles out there that are more um, directory listings and kind of these uh, blogs that aren't really, uh, not, you wouldn't recognize them as a competitor necessarily, but as just a, a massive index of content. Um, those are going to be really good ones to go after because they're really not, they're very diversified and they're not necessarily nailing down on one specific topic. So that's going to be another clue to look after. So this is what the Mozbar looks like in action. Once you plug in the Mozbar, turn that toggle on, you're going to start to see all this data. So the keyword search term that was searched here is gardening tips. Very big seed keyword, very broad, and you can see the page authority for these top three search results very high. Um, the top one and the third one being the highest for page authority. And I will recommend in this uh, research style, focus on page authority, because that's what we're really trying to outrank is the page. So we're not necessarily trying to beat the whole domain of the whole website of, of this competitor here. We're really just trying to do better in this a specific page um, and provide value for that. So these are, are a little high. Honestly, it's going to be very difficult to beat HGTV. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, also, if you like see the brand name, like, oh, yeah, everybody knows that. It's going to be a little hard, especially if your website's brand new. Maybe if you've had a blog for a long time and you have built up a, a good following and you can kind of measure your own traffic metrics, uh, you can certainly go after it. But it's, it's just going to be a lot more work. So I took from that gardening tip seed keyword, and in my list was, uh, vegetable gardening for beginners and that's a long tail keyword it's a lot more specific has a little more direction it's specific towards a certain niche of beginners and vegetables and uh, the page authority is a lot lower here um, the second and third are a little you know they're still um, a little higher than the 20 um, page authority but I, I see this as a good opportunity that this would be a really good uh, keyword to focus on to write some awesome content around and you'd be able to kick off especially that very top one. Um, and when I say kick off, uh, knock the ranking down and put yours up top, uh, that's going to require a lot of things. But just starting here is going to be the beginning because you can kind of find those gaps. Find where you're going to best fit in. So we get into building trust now. So comp uh, after competitor analysis, we need to get to work, content writing. And I love to have this mindset of building trust as I go into writing any copy because it takes my own perspective out of I want traffic, I want people to come here, I want engagement, I want conversions, all this kind of technical mindset of what the results are going to be to I want to build a connection, I want to build trust, I want to be a place of somewhere that somebody can go to find the answers that they are looking for in a way that's actually going to feed them the answer fully and wholly and not leave out blanks and not really provide what's needed. So some of my favorite tips, these very basic tips for content writing, um, write freely at first. Again, this concept of brain dumping all your ideas out on paper, getting everything out first, just writing. I like to put pen to paper in this example just to really get everything out. And then you can start using your target, whatever keyword you're looking at, to start to narrow in your focus 
and really discover if this is something you're really passionate about and enough so that you can write a really excellent piece of content. Uh, keep your sentences concise, and especially in the very beginning of your content, keep it really short and sweet. Use your keyword term, the specific target that you're trying to rank for in the beginning of your content. That's going to be in the beginning of your headline, uh, your, your tag, your, uh, your title for your page, and it's going to be in the beginning of your actual content. <clears throat> we don't want to use overuse the keyword. Three times is plenty, um, but we do want to be using it in the very beginning of our content. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't do more than that. Um, it, it, what you can do is use your related search terms. So I always encourage my clients to have their document open with all these related search terms to the one that they're uh, writing about. So if it was the gardening tips for uh, vegetable gardening tips for beginners, have your document open with some related terms that are related to that search term and start to include those in your content. So rather than repeating the same phrase over and over, you can use these related search terms. Google is becoming more contextual by the minute. It really is understanding in a bigger level what we're writing about. So we don't need to get too hung up on using the particular keyword specifically too much. And you'll get penalized if you use it too much. Um, include images, charts, lists, videos, anything that you can do to break up your content. Uh, having blocks of, of writing is, is great, but not everybody learns that way. A lot of people are vi vi uh, visual and auditorial learners, so providing them with different avenues of feeding your content, and it's just going to make you more valuable. It's going to make you a better place, a better resource to come to, because all different walks of life are going to come and find something that they need. Uh, and comprehensive content is key. Uh, so often I see these lists of uh, a blog post that has the top 100 um, you know, maybe it's the top 100 seeds for your uh, garden. And it just kind of lists each individual one and has like maybe a sentence or two for each. And then you're on information overload. I'm going to bookmark this for later and I'm never going to come back to it. And you're like, oh, this is so helpful. But I'm not, it's lost in my bookmarks, my sea of bookmarks. Don't even want to show you that. It's insane. Really need to clean that up. But so rather than trying to just really short and sweet give your list. I would love to see comprehensive content. And if you're going to write 100, 100 lists, numbered lists, have each one be really extensive. Give them the steps. Give them every single thing that they need to know for each individual number that you're talking about. Be as comprehensive as possible. And really, I'm seeing that these guides that are coming out, especially in the SEO world, um, this comprehensive content that really gives you everything you need to know is what ranks best. It's something that people do keep coming back to because they recognize it as a valuable resource. They can take it one bit at a time. They can maybe even come to it and find a specific step that they're looking for and dive into that process because it's so comprehensive. So moving on and really improving your click-through rate with your content is going to become a, an important aspect of fine-tuning uh, your content writing. So I love using Quora and Udemy for uh, structure clues and inspiration and really va validating my own um, intention for writing. Because if I can look on Quora or uh, Udemy and find similar uh, content related to what I'm looking to do, I can maybe understand that there is a question for this, there is a need. Um, it kind of revalidates the keyword research you've already done. And it gives you some inspiration of, here's what this course instructor on Udemy has done. You can look at the structure of the content. In no, no way are you going to be ripping it off. It's more getting that inspiration of, what are they doing? And what, do I, what would I do? And how can I meet in the middle of, where are the gaps in between? What kind of content is missing in that structure or outline that you're seeing? And specifically with Quora, what kind of questions do people ask that maybe you would answer better? That uh, you li love an answer, but you'd like to elaborate on. Maybe there's multiple answers that you can combine together to really provide that com comprehensive content. Um, adding modifiers to your titles is super helpful for click-through rate. Uh, any of these modifiers are awesome, depending on what kind of content you're writing. Uh, so in the example of you know, your top uh, top, the best seeds for gardening, top 10 best seeds for 
growing your own garden, using a number at the very beginning of your page title is going to be really helpful. Um, it's been proven that that having a little number identifier, three best tips, three reasons why, ten ways to do this is going to really draw people in. And it gives them a clue as to what the style of content is that you're writing so that they kind of have this idea of what they're getting already before they even click. And it just gives that extra value. Uh, bucket brigades are awesome as well. It actually is something that was used long ago in, uh, in editorial columns and uh, research papers uh, to keep the, rate, the reader going. Um, so it really is these little stopping points. And it also helps to break up your content, adds a little more white space to make it a little more visually appealing. So adding any of these kind of uh, uh, phrases in between your content really leads the person in. And even when they're scanning the page and they see some of these, they're going to be like, ooh, what is what's that? Like, It gets better? It gets worse? I don't know. It just, I, I love it. It draws you in. Um, so it brings us to really drawing all of this stuff together, keyword research, competitor analysis, and content writing. We're being intentional, we're being aware, and we're building trust. And really what all that comes down to is being of service. I'm very much in my own life trying to be of service in every aspect that I can. And I think that that ties in extremely well with the WordPress community. I have been supported by my WordPress community in more ways than I can count. And being of service allows us to give back to our communities, allows us to be that authority in our industry. It allows us to be that person that somebody trusts. They're going to come back to time and time again. You build this loyalty with your people. And it just becomes this really happy little place on the internet, your happy little garden you've created that people are, keep coming back to to find new fruits and new, uh, new value from you. So I encourage all of you to be of service in <laughs> your process of SEO and in writing awesome content. So thank you. <laughs> so do we have any, any questions coming up around any of this? Yes, uh, I prefer to have a, the comprehensive kind of goes in with this. The longer pieces of content are going to be better, uh, more than 500 words at least. But I try to go above 1,000 um, with the content that I'm encouraging my clients to write, especially if they're trying to become an authority in their industry. You really got to dive deep, <laughs> got to spend the time. And it's better to write content uh, less frequently, more in depth, than it is to write more frequently just short little bursts of content. Uh, I'm seeing people that are doing that are not, they're spending a lot more time writing and it's just not as, as valuable, not getting as much conversion. Uh, but if you spend, if you write one post a month and it's really comprehensive and you just keep promoting it, uh, that's really going to be a lot more valuable to you. And I didn't mention uh, promotion. Uh, that's a whole other conversation, but writing content, you know, you build it, they might come, but you need to promote it to get them there. You need to be promoting and every avenue that you can. Uh, networking with other bloggers in your industry or related industries is a good way to do that. Having them share your content and vice versa and uh, really any way that you can get yourself out there. Promotion is going to be a big piece. Anything else? so many terms that they want to hit for that they have a hard time narrowing yes. it down. How, how would you approach that situation? Absolutely. And that is something I'm actually just starting to work with clients that are more interested in writing content, as, as shifting away from my own writing, just because I love to have my client be the voice. And it, it's a great question. I usually go really in depth and I'll go through my own analysis of the keywords and find those gaps for myself and see related to the competitor analysis side of things, like where those gaps are in content and the terms of where it's best to focus those uh, long tail keywords. I'll pull out maybe 10 of them and go a little deeper and say, here's what your competitor is doing. 
Here's what their content looks like. Here's the structure. Uh, this is what's missing. They're not using any videos. They're not using any images. They're not asking questions. They're not using lists. Um, or maybe they are, uh, depending on what you're looking at. And then offer them, if you did this, then that. If you, did, if you wrote, wrote a longer piece of content that covers this, this, and this, you're going to be a better answer to this question than your competitor. So I kind of dive deep into each specific that they're going to go into with writing the content for a particular keyword. And then I usually ask them, what do you want to write about? Like looking at this keyword doc, what speaks to you? Like what really jumps out to you? And then I'll do some extended research to say, this is where your focus can be. Um, so we really do take it in chunks. This is meant to be a living, breathing document that you're going to keep coming back to. Um, so does that answer your question? Yes. OK. Thank you. Rambling. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, Udemy is uh, really helpful with that in terms of the structure of the content. So if you're uh, combining some big ideas, uh, taking a look at those class structures and just getting some clues as to what your structure might look like. So I usually have like a Udemy structure that I'm looking at that really fits well with my content. And then I kind of create my own based on that and taking it in blocks. It's not a, so the reason I was asking mm -hmm. was Mm. audience on this particular subject. So it kind of connects the dots for you yeah. and everything. So in, in other words, what it, they can just look at it and say, okay, I need to cut this piece of text and put it into my speech. Mm. No, but maybe there is. Not that I am, I don't know. It's, uh, it's so subjective. And I think I've just kind of built my own process of what that looks like for depending on the individual client. It's a lot of conversation um, that I have to have to nail down that, those connections and how everything interweaves together. Um, it's, it's interesting, yeah. It's a good question. Um, and it's difficult because it is very individual to each niche that you're looking at. And it's really about how you approach it, you know, how your flow of content is, is going. And I guess this is just the blueprint. This is the blueprint for writing that piece, for putting all those dots together. But it really does come down to us to put those dots together individually. Um. I mean, there's, there's certain things you, you want to say, this is what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think depending on where your focus is, you can certainly get that structure. Like Udemy is a good place for that specifically of understanding all the pain points that need to be met. Um, but yeah, it's, it would be cool to see a tool that really helps us to mind map. I'm almost visualizing this like mind map of ideas and like how it all connects and then giving you like a, a structure of like do this next, tie these two in together. Maybe somebody can build it. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and ask another one. Rather than, than talk specific rates, about how long does it take you to put together a, a list or a, a form that you just give to a client? There are many different rates throughout this room, but mm -hmm. how, how long might someone expect to work? To actually produce the keyword research document? Um, I can get them done pretty quickly, but I, I usually try to give myself at least two weeks because I like to keep coming back and refining. Uh, usually the, my first uh, brain dump is, is really extensive and a lot depending on the client. Uh, a lot of topics we want to kind of cover and then I kind of nail it down as I'm doing working through each individual tool. It's a lot of data to cipher through, um, but you'll start to see patterns. 
And I like to give myself plenty of time to see those patterns. And especially if it's a client I'm not too familiar with their industry, I need to do my own reading and research and really take a look at the competitor side of things a little more in depth to really hone in on what's going to be of value. Um, I really, it would, how many hours does it take? It's really, it's really individual to the client. Sometimes I have clients that only have like three or four tabs because they're only focusing on specific services or products. But if it's a blogger, like I have a lifestyle coach uh, or a life coach that um, has a, like almost, I think I have 30 seed tabs for her and that took upwards of six hours. Um, but the more basic sites, I could get it done in two hours usually. And then I just keep refining. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. How horrible is it to rank for the same keyword like, twice later? It's just confusing to Google. Like it, it's gonna, you're not helping yourself because Google's not sure which one to put on on search result page. Like it's, you know, it's it's not gonna. You're kind of spreading your efforts out in too many ways. So if you hone in, maybe choosing a similar keyword, like just that what your focus is on, uh, it could be a related search term to that. It doesn't need to be that specific same term. It can just be adjusted a little bit. Because um, there's going to be a lot of other related search terms, and that's going to help you become more contextual. You've got a lot of different kind of content pieces related around the same topic, and it's fueling the same idea. Just the keyword is a little different. So look at your contextual uh, keywords. Look at the Google suggests for that keyword, and then maybe change it to one of those that are relevant and start including that in your content. Or combine them too. If they're really similar, combine them. Make it comprehensive. Fantastic oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. There's a lot of really good information in the short amount of time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would focus more on the comprehensive side, so get a really awesome like piece of content that is unlike anything else out there. Really get specific of where your value is, and then promote it like heck. Like everywhere you can, email lists. If you're building your email list, that's okay. Uh, start making connections with uh, related industries. Of, um, for example, like the the life coach I'm working with, she works with a lot of uh, psycho psychologists and um, doctors even. So making relationships with those people that have a blog presence or an online community presence and doing interviews with them, getting your uh, presence in their communities helps to lead them back to you. And it is hard when you're first starting, but just being consistent as well is going to be really important. Like, don't get discouraged. People, you're going to be able to use this comprehensive content you create at some point. Even if it's not right now, it's not really bearing fruit for you at this moment, it will. And just being consistent with writing and promoting like heck. I'm probably going to do another talk on promoting, so because <laughs> that's a whole other piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like how do I, what is my uh, it would depend on the kind of metadata it's referring to. Usually it's that little description underneath your search result. So you want to make sure that that's not having a little three dot at the end of a continued text that it's pulling from your article. You want to write your own descriptive uh, meta description. So that's going to be that little <laughs> block of text that shows up under your search result. And it's just going to allow the, the searcher to better understand what the content piece is about. And it usually includes your keyword or some related keywords. And uh, alt tags are going to be important. Um, yeah, making sure that uh, your uh, if if you know schema markup, that's going to help as well for your metadata aspect of things. But yeah, you're welcome. When you say comprehensive content, is that the same thing as cornerstone content? Essentially, I mean, it, it, it you might not every piece of comprehensive content might be cornerstone content. It could be, um, but I'm just saying like everything that you write. Don't half-ass it. Like, 
go all in. <laughs> go all in. Spend your time well. You know, if you're going to do it, do it right. And that's the being of service aspect. Like, if your mindset is in a place of service rather than traffic, uh, it's, you're going to enjoy the experience more. Expectations are a tough thing. It's, uh, it's definitely something I bump up against in every client. And I've actually become very specific with who I want to work with because of this, because I've had some nightmare uh, just experiences where people's expectations are very unrealistic for what SEO is now today. Uh, they have this mindset of just do it. And that's just not how it works. <laughs> like you've got to, it's a living, breathing thing. It's our garden that we're nurturing time and time again. We have to keep coming back to it. Uh, so I, I like to be very upfront with uh, my expectations in the beginning. I do a lot of training with my SEO clients of like, this is what SEO looks like today. This is a reasonable expectation for what you're looking at. We need content. We need you to be writing content. Otherwise, your site isn't going to be ranking the way you want it to. And um, what was the first part of your question? Link building. Um, it ties in very well with link building. Um, link building and promotion are a whole other aspect of this, this conversation that are very important. Uh, and link building is, is key. It's, it's really important. It's probably, this is the first half of my process. Link building is the second. And it's just a whole, I couldn't fit it into this because it's just such a big topic. Um, but do as much research around link building as you can and do it well, be it of service make good relationships. It's a good opportunity to make friends and like really like utilize your networks and be of help to people because you might have somebody in your industry that is doing something really awesome that's not what you're doing, but it kind of ties in well. And if you can look at where their content and see like, hey, I think your readers would really benefit from this or hey, I'm offering a free ebook. Like I wonder if you if your readers would like this. Like really considering those ideas of how could I help this other influencer? That's a that's a good conversation to have. Yeah. When you do that, do you, do you reach out and ask them to give you a link, or do you do it more subtly? So subtly, uh, I don't tend to get links very uh, uh, consistently if I just write out and ask. Usually, peeling back the layers of the conversation, I try to make a, a connection first, and maybe even just write some comments on their blog and really in-depth comments too. Be like, hey, this is what I thought about this, and. Um, Depending on the client, I usually try to encourage them to do that. Um, for my own personal stuff, obviously, I'll dive in deep with my own personal opinions and things. But when it's the client, I, I encourage them to have a list of uh, some bloggers that they're inspired by or that they would love to connect with and just be present with them. And then when the time is right that you have a good piece of content or an offering you want to share, like, hey, I thought you might enjoy this. And don't even ask for a link, just say, I thought that this might be helpful and see what happens. And you know, it's not going to work every time, but it's at least an opportunity to build that connection. Do you have any other uh, guides or resources that you recommend to build this one? Uh, Backlinko. Backlinko.com. Uh, back -o -o uh, Brian Dean is awesome. He's got, uh, he's the best link builder, like content wise, of guides and things like that that you can look into. Brian, Brian Dean. Yeah. Um, so I heard you say go all in on a topic. Yes. And I'm feeling that. But whenever, <laughs> whenever I think about some clients, you know, some think that they're a user experience expert and they think, well, I, I like all this content here, but can we get it on branched pages? Does the branch page scenario delete your page authority? Yes. Wow, I put a lot of effort in this. This is great. And do I think now to create an index hub and then branch off to all these individual articles? That kind of. Uh, yeah, and so your comprehensive content can be a, a branch. Awfully comprehensive. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and, it, it, and then maybe you do di dive into a rabbit hole of like this topic I'm going into and this one content I'm writing could be a whole other thing, and that's great. Put that link into your original piece and direct them to read more about this. 
Um, yes. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. Right. Don't just like have a link like this is the definition of this word. No, it's got to be a whole other article of comprehensive data. Mm -hmm. Is that domain name authority, or is that the domain that you're working in? It's the the actual like URL, the the domain oh, okay. of the the entirety of the of the website and how that website as a whole is ranked. Um, that's why I like to look at page authority more specifically because you're looking to outrank pages, not not websites. Um, you're looking to do better with a particular page over the domain because the domain is going to be a whole. That's a big thing to go after. But it does give you a clue, um, like if it's a big brand, uh, like HGTV was that one, that's going to be a hard competitor to beat because every one of their pages are probably at a high authority because their root domain is at a high authority. I'll see a high authority for pages or for domains and then like zero page authority for uh, certain pieces of content. So that's that little clue of like, oh, I can beat that page at least. Mm -hmm. It certainly could be helpful. I haven't um, had a need to do that um, in, in my circles, but I work with a lot of uh, smaller uh, people. Um, so for bigger people that do have the money to spend on something like that, it definitely could be helpful. That's something to look at, uh, the history of that domain. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I grow okay. Mm -hmm. How important would it be to put like the name of the town in the domain? Does that help a lot? Um, in the actual of in the the, the, the it was um, the restaurant name and then Raleigh, mm -hmm. like in the dot com. I I would more focus on local SEO efforts differently. Um, I think you could do that, especially if it's your branding. I'd much rather see a domain that's related to your branding specifically. I do have clients that have the local in it just because their, their domain was already taken, so they've kind of just gone that route. But really what's going to help you is act the actual local SEO optimization on the site. Uh, the domain is only going to be maybe for a keyword that that will help, but really just doing your local SEO, which is a whole other conversation, uh, is going to be more important than that. Uh, schema markup is definitely important for local. Um, if you uh, look into any schema, uh, there's a, a good schema plugin for WordPress that I use, and um, it's really helpful to help Google understand your where your map is, where your location is, and all the details. Where is that, where is that plugin? Uh, uh, schema markup. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you so much. I love you guys. <laughs>